Let's go to work. Um, but before I get into the word today, um, I got to tell you, Deb told me a joke, y'all. <laughs> oh, yes. Deb told me a joke, and I got to tell it to y'all because I, I laughed. She said, do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. You laughed. She said, do you know why they don't allow Jesus? Do you know why they don't allow Jesus in the jewelry store? Talk about it. Somebody else. <laughs> ah, because he breaks every chain. Amen. Listen to me. I am easily amused. Um, and so if you have a joke, I want to hear it. Will you say unleashed? unleashed? Listen, go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Um, Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start at verse 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So it may be a little bit different than the version that you're reading from, but it is all the word of God. Um, I, am, I, am, uh, I am excited to share the word with you guys today. I, I, I pray that it blesses you. Um, for those of you guys that are willing to talk back to me, will you say amen? amen? That's what I'm talking about. I need some people willing to talk back to me today. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say wait on me. Amen. Matthew 16, 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Thus is the reading of the scripture. Will you say unleashed? unleashed. Before we launch into the message, um, I would be remiss to not give you some background. See, I encourage you to read the entire chapter. For though I intend to give you a glimpse of God's word through a form of a sermon. It's important for you to search the scriptures yourself. Will you say amen to that? Amen. It's important. It's important for you to be able to see what the word says and what God is saying to you yourself. See, I don't, I've shared it with you before, but I want you to see the scripture. In Acts 17, 11, the word of God reads, these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And so I'm going to set up the text, but I encourage you to go back and read the word yourself that you might see what thus saith the Lord. But to set up the text, Jesus, Jesus had just had a heated discussion with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah, if you read the scripture, you'll see uh, they began the chapter requesting him to show them a sign. And so Jesus responds that they seem to have the ability to discern everything else. Why do you need a sign on this? Do, do you know people like that? Do you know people that can find a reason for everything? Except a reason to support you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they can make sense of everything except what it is that you're trying to explain to them. Jesus is saying you're trying to perceive everything else. You can discern everything else except what's happening here right now within the within the world. You have the savior and so what Jesus ends up saying is um, that it is wicked and adulterous for them to request a sign. Once again, calling them on their hypocrisy. Then as the disciples depart, he tells them to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Can I give you point number one real early in the message? Okay. Point number one is be clear on who has your ear. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be 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 clear on who has your ear. The disciples think he's talking about bread and the fact that they don't have any. That's what happens in the scripture. He he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And they began reasoning among themselves, asking, is he mad at us that we didn't bring a loaf with us? But Jesus is actually referencing the spiritual wickedness of religious leaders. And and when he uses leaven, it is a metaphor mirroring the way that leaven permeates or spreads throughout something, thus transforming that which it is spreading throughout the way that yeast is a leavening agent, transforming the outcome of bread, causing it to rise. See, it's important to understand. And one of the things that Jesus says to them as they begin when, when they begin reasoning among themselves on whether or not he's talking about bread, he says now. You were with me when I fed the 5,000. All I had was sardines and saltines. Um, And if that wasn't enough, you were also with me when I fed 4,000. How in the world would I be worried about bread? You have to be clear on who has your ear. And I say that because whoever it is that you're talking to on a regular basis is shaping your perspective of the world. They are shaping your reasoning power. They're they are shaping. They are shaping your vocabulary. You use the words that the top five people that you communicate with on a regular basis use. You speak like them, which means if you speak in profanity on a regular basis. You speaking profanity on a regular basis, meaning somebody's cussing you out on a regular basis. You, <laughs> all right, they're not cussing you out; they're just cussing to you. Um, and so you have to be clear on who has your ear. Um, it, it's important to understand, right, that 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 when he says, "Beware of the sp- spiritual wickedness of religious leaders." which is due to their influence and their potential to penetrate the people of God and permeate their faith, causing them to turn away from God and become self-serving, therefore emulating the very leaders that they're following. And so Jesus says, beware, be careful of the influence you allow to have impact in your life and in your faith. You have to be clear on who has your ear. But then Jesus But then Jesus takes one of the smoothest approaches that I've ever seen. Jesus is smooth to me, y'all. It is masterful the way that he broaches the subject. Because if you recall being a child, all of us were always more inclined to report what somebody else said or did. You've never been in that situation where you run back and you say, I don't don't know, but they're over there. And then they ask you, yeah, well, what did you do? Uh, 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 We get tongue tied when it's about us, right? Jesus takes a masterful approach at having a conversation. And I want you I want you to think about I want to frame this text from this perspective. Right. I want you to think about reputation. Thank you, babe. She said, let me tie your shoe. Amen. Come on. Put your. I didn't know it was untied. Hey, this is kind of uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be tripping. Thank you. I want to frame this text through these three words. I want you to think about reputation. I want you to think about revelation. And I want you to think about replication. And so those are the main themes that I want this story and this text to fit within. And so what happens is Jesus is saying um, in verse 13, he says, who do men say that I am? Point number one, excuse me, point number two is reputation. Who, who do men say that? Now, I, I need to make sure that you understand from this perspective. Jesus is not concerned with the opinions of man. Because if you know, the word says that he did not have need of man to testify 
on his behalf. He didn't need anybody to speak to who it was that he was because he knew who he was. And when he was baptized, it said that it opened up. And the voice of God said, this is my son. In whom I am well pleased. I don't need nobody else to talk about how pleased they are with me. See, society today will tell you if you don't got no likes. If you're not popular. If people don't know your name and get excited when you walk in the room, then that means that you. Jesus was not asking them, who do men say that I am as a means of validation for who it was that God had created and called him to be? I need you to make sure that you understand that, because too often we are trying to figure out whether or not people will validate us in order to determine the validity of our purpose. Jesus was not concerned about whether or not people were saying that he was the Christ. What he was trying to figure out is with all that I've done, how is the news spreading right now? See, by this time, Jesus had raised Jairus' daughter. He had fed the 5,000. He fed 4,000. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. People that were blind were beginning to see. Lame was beginning to walk. And so it makes sense because what you have to understand is what he did is he used reputation as a vehicle to revelation. And so what happens is Jesus says, who? Let me ask y'all a question. This was an amazing icebreaker if you think about it. See, when you use an icebreaker, what you're trying to do is get people talking. Because there's something more significant that you want to have a conversation about. And so he starts out with something that people are very comfortable talking about. Other people. Oh, we good talking about other people. Did you hear about what so-and-so did? You know that they lost it. You, you know they're getting divorced. You know that they... We don't have a problem talking about other people's business. And so Jesus says, I'm going to use the vehicle of reputation in order to talk about revelation. I need to know what it is that people are saying. Can I tell you what else is interesting? When I say be clear on who has your ear, I think Jesus was also assessing and analyzing the type of company. He was assessing the type of company that the disciples were keeping. You have to understand that if you're in my inner circle, I need to know who it is that has your ear, who you're talking to on a regular basis. See, you have to understand that as a leader, it is easy for me to identify when the people that are surrounding me are having conversations with people that don't share the same ideas and perspectives and ethical values that I share. And so they'll come in. They'll come in the staff meeting and start talking sideways. Afterwards, I say, who you been talking to? <laughs> who is it that men say that I am? Reputation. Based on the social circles that you run in. Right. What, they saying? what are they saying to you? About me. See, because you have to understand, and it might be my orientation. This might be something that you say, you know what, Pastor Kevin said that, that went in one ear and out the other. But I need you to understand where I come from. Why would somebody be comfortable talking about me in the midst of you? Why? Why were they so confident saying to you? See, because you have to understand if they can drag my name through the mud in your presence. You probably shouldn't be in my inner circle. You can't be a disciple of mine if they're able to drag my name through the mud with you. Oh, uh, you ain't never thought about that. Next time somebody comes and tell you, you know, they said that you were a dirty, low down scoundrel. That's interesting. What, what did they say after you flipped the table in there? If you don't mind me asking, I need to know. What did they say after? Because I know you and I know how you are about me. After you tore up everything, how did they? How long you been out of jail? Because I need, I know. Reputation. Jesus is using reputation 
as a vehicle to revelation. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is important for us to understand that for all of us, the onset of our faith was rooted in reputation. It was the reputation of the Lord that allowed us as a vehicle into revelation. Before God revealed himself to you, somebody else told you about a God that they serve. See, it's important for you to understand that one of the things that Jesus was trying to assess is the culture of the people that he was serving. I've been doing all of these good works. How is the good news of the gospel spreading in the region? that I've been going through. How are people beginning to say, I was there when he healed Jairus' daughter. I was there with the woman with it. We almost stoned her. But reputation was the vehicle by which you experienced revelation. You first heard somebody preaching the good news of Jesus Christ before you came into the revelation of who Christ was. And so I love what Jesus does, right? He, um, he begins talking about reputation as an icebreaker into revelation. So he follows up with Matthew 16, 15, where he said, and it says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Y'all ever been in here when I was talking about the story? And then I stopped talking about the story and I show you a mirror about you. I learned that from Jesus. Um, Jesus says, what, the, what are they saying? Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. And, and what are you saying? Now, I need you to understand, right, that when he says, but who do you say that I am? It is important for us to be able to understand that as that vehicle of reputation translates into revelation, right? It is important for you to note that at some point you have to go from milk to meat. Meaning that you cannot live off of the glory of somebody else's God. At some point, you've got to be talking about your God. You have to begin talking about the God that you serve. Not the God of my grandmother, not the God of my grandfather, not the God of my mother. I got to be able to say, but that is my, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. See, at some point, I've got to go from reputation to revelation. I know what they said about God, but let me tell you how I've experienced him. He's been working miracles in my life. God cleaned me up. Yeah. So he says, um, I hear what you're saying. I, I know, I know you say what they said about me, but who is it that you say that I am? And, and in Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answers and said, you are the Christ. Now that's one out of 12. Um, they didn't say it in unison. It was, oh, can I, can I help you to understand that sometimes it's just going to be you? Can, can I tell you that it's got to be okay for you to go alone? Can, can I tell you that if nobody else speaks up, that you should allow your voice to be heard? That you don't wait for somebody to get on the bandwagon with you? See, people will not join your cause until they can begin seeing the success from it. And so you can't wait around for other people. So I love it. Peter, Peter answers and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Point number three is revelation, as I've said. Right. I need you guys to understand, though, as there are layers to this, I think that part of it, part of what Jesus is asking is he's saying, OK, you've heard from other people about me. But based on your proximity to me, there should be some things that you have the ability to verbalize yourself. And I need you guys to understand, right? Because when he asked, who do men say that I am? They, they said, well, some think that you're John the Baptist. Some, some think that you're Elijah. Some think that you're Jeremiah. Now, it's important for you to understand, right? That while they were not accurate, they also weren't necessarily wrong. And the reason I say that is because Jesus was all of that. Jesus was all of that and more. John the Baptist. Why John the Baptist? Because he was a voice in the wilderness crying out, telling you, you need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was telling them about forgiveness. 
He was saying to them, you've got to turn your heart away from those things that separate you from God and turn towards repentance so that you can have the salvation of the Lord. They said, you're Elijah. If you know anything about Elijah, Elijah was a miracle working prophet. Elijah was up there on Mount Carmel by himself. They were ready to kill him. What was 400 of those? Up? And he's like, you know what? Maybe y'all got to sleep today. Y'all got might be on a journey or something. I don't know. But my God is about to send fire from on high. Elijah was a miracle working prophet. So you got Jesus who is telling them about the salvation of the Lord. The repentance of sin and the forgiveness and then he's out there, got the nerve to be feeding more people than he's got food enough to cover. Raising up lame, allowing blind to see, raising up people to die. And then Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Understand that the reason he was the weeping prophet is because there was a level of compassion in him and a love for the people of God. That when he saw things that were not going according to God's will in their lives, it broke his heart. And so the same Jesus is all of that and more. And so then he says, who? Well, who is it that you say that I am? Simon Peter says, you're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. See, I think the other layer of this in Revelation is not merely our ability to articulate who it is that Jesus is. But our ability to replicate what it is that Jesus did. Oh, see, I need you guys to understand that when he says, who do men say that I am? Part of that is not merely what it is that they're saying, but what it is that they're doing. And so when it turns back on the disciples, he says, now, closest people to me, <laughs> closest people to me are y'all. When people see you, what does it say about me? Oh, can I get real personal in here? If you know, you know that there's, there's, there's a group of fellas around me on a regular basis. Uh, and some of those fellas are married. Other fellas are not. Ladies, I just want to make sure that it's clear to you, because if you got eyes for a brother in here and he's not got eyes for you, I'm going to explain to you why. The fellas that's around me in here. If they see a beautiful lady in this congregation and they say, Pastor, who, 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 who is that? I say, oh, that's Nunya. <laughs> see, I need you guys to understand that my perspective is this. Unless you're serious. I know my people. <laughs> Unless you're serious, that's none of your business. Because whether or not you think about it, you're connected to me. I can't have nobody connected to me. Serial dating in the congregation. Y'all better stop playing with me. That's none your last name business. None your. Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, all right, now you told me about my reputation. How is it that you're walking out? Who it is you know me to be? When people see you, are they seeing an extension of me? Or are they seeing an extension of them? Are you more in line with what people say about me than what it is you know about me? See, because all of us can say that we've been in some difficult situations. Things have happened in our lives that nobody else knows about. And you know that God was there, that he walked with you, that he covered you, that he protected you, that he healed you from it. God is saying, listen, I know what our relationship is. I'm asking you who it is that you say that I am, but I know who it is that I've been to you. 
How is it you walking out? How are you walking out the who? How has the reputation been a vehicle to the revelation that leads into the replication? Because all of us should be taking who it is that we know God to be and walking it out in everyday life. I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about being consistent, though. See, you have to understand that consistency don't mean that I just, I mean, every single time. But this is what I do consistently. Is, is there an off moment? Absolutely. Sometimes you're going to catch me. I ain't have as much sleep as I should have had. Y'all don't never get angry. I learned something about myself um, last week. I was in the car. I was in the car with Carlos and Sharita. We was going, we was going to eat. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, you know, sometimes you see yourself away. And I can't remember what we, we were talking about, just, you know, kindness. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm always, I'm always kind. I'm just nice all the time. <laughs> Sharita looked at me. She said, uh, okay. <laughs> Look, ladies, y'all laughing because y'all know y'all do that to us. Fellas, Pastor Darrell, if I'm not careful, I'll walk away being like, yeah, she said, okay. She must see. Yeah. <laughs> but it was something in the okay. You know what I'm it was like an undertone of not okay in the okay. And so I said, well, what, what, uh, what's that? What, what'd, you, what'd you mean? She said, oh, I'm just saying, you know, you can be a bit ornery when, you, um, when you're tired or when you're hungry. I said, yeah. She said, yeah. And the thing is, I know about myself that I can be a little bit more sharp. You like that, you're going to take that with you, aren't you? I can be a little sharper, you know, in those times. But you know how you know yourself and you know that you're trying extra hard, even in those difficult times? So hard, in fact, that you convince yourself that you've covered it. <laughs> I'm just me by myself. You think that you covered it. You think you did a good job. You think, oh, I, I handled that, ace that test. And she's like, no, I know this. I said, <laughs> I see you got a little less rope, but I got grace for you. I got, I got, I extend some mercy to you. So I don't, you know, I don't get sharp back. See, it's important for you to be able to know through the lens of God who you are consistently. Not that you won't have off moments. Not that you won't make mistakes. And not that the people around you won't have to extend grace and mercy to you. But that on a consistent basis, this is who you know me to be, though. And so in those off moments, you can look and extend that grace because you're saying, mm, you're under some stress right now. <laughs> you hungry. Because <laughs> you're not yourself when you're hungry. <laughs> Revelation. Revelation being the vic vehicle to replication. In Matthew 6, 18, the word says, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Verse 19 says, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven which is where that replication comes. See, and I wanna give you some scriptures today because I want you to understand that when Jesus talks about having the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the principles that we are to live our lives by. See, I need you guys to understand that as much as we declare that scripture, that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, you've gotta understand that that's a principle. But that principle that key unlocks heaven in order to make sure that you live with sufficiency. But you must understand that the principle is attached to a prerequisite. That if you look at that scripture in Philippians 4, what happened there is that Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, because you have sown into my life, 
My prayer is that my God shall supply. Oh, I need you to understand the context of the scripture. Some of us are running around not sowing anything anywhere. And then you have the audacity to talk about my God shall supply. Jesus is up there saying, baby, that's a key, but you're trying to unlock the wrong door. You don't have the key to the door that you're trying to unlock because you have not fulfilled the prerequisite. See, replication is going to require you understanding the principle of God in its proper context. Because only then can you apply the appropriate key to the appropriate door that unlocks what it is that you're asking for from heaven. Does that make sense to you? And so I want to give you a couple of scriptures. I want you to go to Galatians 6, 7. I want you to note these, if nothing else. Galatians 6 and 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Will you say keys? This is a key that unlocks the kingdom of heaven so that you can loose what it is that you need on earth. But you have to understand that if you sow nothing, I'm telling you to apply this wherever you want. If it's monetary for you, then make it monetary. If it's love for you, then make it love. If it's peace for you, then make it peace. If it's health for you, listen to what I'm saying to you. You can't put poison in your body and then try to figure out why you got ailments. Whatever it is that you saw, whatever you put in, you're going to get that back. Now, the wonderful thing about this key is that you can't control how and how much you get back. See, God's math is different than our math. And so you have to understand that the way that God multiplies is different than the way that we multiply. And so when when you are in the mind space of sowing, you've got to make sure that you sow whatever it is that God is telling you to sow. When he's telling you to sow with the expectation of knowing that God gives back better. Amen. Amen. 